Good afternoon, everyone. Though goodness knows there have been better afternoons in our nation's history than the ones we're having this week, but any afternoon beginning with a conversation with Judy Samuelson about the passions that have animated her career has to be good. Uh, as Judy writes in this wonderful book, which I hope you will all soon have, business is the most influential institution of our day. It has the talent, the resources, and the problem-solving skills like no other institution has. So what can be done to incent, if not guide that influence to solve the world's biggest challenges? To say nothing of avoiding making many of those problems worse. And we surely have problems galore. We are meeting today during a global pandemic a global recession that results from it, uh, one exacerbating extraordinary inequality, and of course, dysfunction and division in government. And I think we're only in a short pause before the existential urgency of climate change uh, will be upon us. And then all of this is accelerated at warp speed by the shocking and unprecedented events in Washington last week with ripples, uh, no, frankly, tsunamis, uh, continuing to spread daily, including, frankly, tidal waves in the C-suites of American business. Whether it's Twitter or Google or Facebook or Apple regarding access to their programs, or many CEOs who had been uh, supporting this administration, perhaps not enthusiastically, but nonetheless, are now making some different calculations. So, Judy, what timing <laughs> for this book. It's really remarkable. Uh, the timing also, let me remind everyone that the book officially goes on sale tomorrow. Yes, obviously, I had an advanced copy. Uh, and also, I'm, I'm aware that many in this audience already don't know Judy, although many do. So let me just introduce her in the program briefly before we start a conversation about the book. Uh, Judy is vice president of the Institute. She's founder and executive director of the Business and Society Program. Uh, and uh, uh, in this book, she describes the profound shifts in attitudes and mindsets that are redefining our very notions of what constitutes business success. I might also add, as I frequently said, and as Judy knows, I think her program, the Business Society program, in many respects inherits much of the founding DNA of the Aspen Institute. That is, the, the, it, it's really inspired by the same thing that brought Walter Pepka to bring many of his fellow CEOs around the country, indeed the world, to Aspen, Colorado in 1949 to ask fundamental questions about the purpose of business and, and in a very broad sense. The book I can just honestly say is eminently readable. It's relatively short. It's always captivating. It's one full of fascinating case studies, uh, profiles of uh, so many of the contributors to the programs that Judy has hosted with her incredible team over the years in Aspen. And finally, as I think many of you have already seen, it's already received extremely favorable notices. For example, uh, the FT, Andrew Ross Sorkin's deal book, also noting its prescient timing. Um, so while, as I said, not all of you know Judy, let me just say a minute about, uh, the, uh, about Judy. She joined us from the Ford Foundation uh, and she and her team have been doing great work ever since at that intersection between business and society, especially focused on values, including a decade long campaign to disrupt Milton Friedman's shareholder based narratives about corporate purpose, a multi year dialogue to produce the aspirin principles of, on long term value. It's, it's actually no accident that the very term short termism is such an epithet now, and that's largely, in, in, or at least in, in many respects, thanks to the great work that Judy and her team have done. And now, uh, a very exciting new partnership with Corn Ferry to rethink executive pay, a topic that I'm sure we are going to get to. So let me jump right in, and let me also say, everyone on the webinar, uh, we are going to be taking questions from you. Uh, I will have those uh, uh, shown to me, and at some point, I will be incorporating those in the ones I ask. But, but Judy, let me just ask, to, to, let's start with the timing here, which I've referenced already. 
obviously you wrote this book uh, well before, you finished it well before the election to say nothing of the events of the last week. Leaving aside the sort of jaw dropping disruptions that are gonna interfere what would normally be a book launch tour around the country, what is it like to launch this book now? And how will you argue that is in, in fact, and I think it is squarely relevant to this incredible national moment we're in? Well, let me first start by saying, Elliot, you and I have been in conversation about these issues for well over a decade. And uh, it's a total pleasure to be able to be having this conversation with you today. It means a lot to me. Um, yeah, what a moment. I mean, you know, when when the, the there was a possibility of putting the book out in the fall because I, you know, the manuscript, first manuscript went in last January. Um, so the choice was made to wait until after the election because who wants to compete with that election uh, in that year? And of course, instead it ends up landing halfway between uh, the Georgia uh, election date and the inaugural and then of course, not even that ends up being a quiet week, anything but it. But, you know, I think it's an amazing moment to be talking about this. Throughout this period of time, let's go back to a year ago, August, when the Business Roundtable landed their remarkable statement about the restatement about the purpose of the corporation. I mean, we've never stopped talking about business since then. It's been very much present. And it's remarkable to me in this moment how much the role of corporations is still continuing to be in our consciousness and right in front of us. And so it's, it's, we know what the work that needs to be done, but this is exposing a lot of blind spots and, and further challenges and they're deeply relevant and things that I care a lot about and that I think are relevant to the book. Well, you know, one, one other just preliminary question, thinking about the moment we're in, and I think it's quite relevant to the themes of your book as well. I actually just looked and uh, the stock market essentially flat, still you know, well over 31,000, the Dow. Um, you know, it skyrocketed uh, during you know, one of the most you know, awful times in, in recent history. Investors are thriving while most people in the country are anything but. Uh, what, what's going on there? And, and do you think it's related to the themes of your book? Yeah, there's a whole chapter on this question, actually. Um, it's a very late, what you're asking is a very layered question. Uh, you know, this has been true for a while, although I got to say last week when the, you know, Dow's reaching new heights in the middle of the, a time when we all felt our country was falling apart. It's, if we needed another cartoon about the disconnect between the stock market, it is not a bellwether. It is, it is a signaling device about how people perceive future valuation, but only a few people really are benefiting from that tremendously. I think something like, you know, my colleague Miguel Padro writes about this, about half of half of the country is in the stock market at all. And for, you know, most of them, 99% of them, they're hold less than $100,000 in the market. So you have a tiny fraction of people who benefit from the stock market overall. The stock market, its valuation itself, the growth in it is due to a very small, tiny number of stocks. It's not a bellwether even for those who are in, who are public companies. And the stock market has been declining as a vehicle for corporations. I mean, the number of public companies is in decline. It's not growing. So it's disconnected in lots, lots of ways. But sorry, you may, it brings me back to a fundamental question about why corporations, and this is something that I think is changing, why corporations spend so much time and effort focused on the stock market as a kind of a signaling device of, of value. It is not, it is you know, Roger Martin wrote about this extensively. You know, he wrote about it based on some work that he started doing with us at the Aspen Institute in part. It is, it is a, it's an aftermarket. You got your money at the IPO. Companies raise their money when they go public to begin with. It's an aftermarket, it's a trading market. It's a place for people to gamble on the future worth of stocks. It is actually disconnected from the real value of firms. And so one of the challenge ahead is whether or not we can 
make sure that the design of companies and the signaling devices and the things we measure actually get disconnected from the stock market as its bellwether and rather come back to real fundamentals of value creation. So you talk here about the six new rules and before we dig into them, and obviously we're not gonna just go through all six, uh, people can read the book for, for that. But before, before we talk about the new rules, what, what are the rule, what are the key rules that they replace? I mean, are they, you know, things like maximize shareholder value, pay for performance? I mean, th those, those are in the Bible, aren't they? <laughs> Pretty much, right on Moses' tablets, as we like to say. Um, you know, the fundamental one is takes us back to the purpose of the corporation. I mean, this is already settled. It's pretty much understood, although people still find it perplexing to learn that, you know, Delaware law doesn't require them to put the shareholder in front of anybody else. Delaware law gives lots of rooms of freedom. I mean, the business judgment rule is, uh, you know, allows boards to you know, lay out a plan and, you know, execute against it. And, you know, they don't have to stop to think what the shareholders want. The shareholders are important because of what we, how we've designed them, you know, into business decision-making through pay and other, other mechanisms. So yes, the first one is just the accounting, that the purpose of corporation is something that the executive, the board, you know, you, you decide the purpose of your own corporation. Aligning to that purpose is what's more complicated. But yes, purpose, that is settled. And that is a fundamental tenet of this, of this book. I guess the other one that I, I would call out is um, how much the, the language, how much our thinking about employees is changing in this moment. It has already changed. I mean, if anything has um, woken us up in the pandemic, it's the kind of humanizing of corporations, reminding us that employees are the corporation. They're not some nameless stakeholder. Um, you know, so the old rule was that employees are a cost of operation. I mean, the new rule is employees are really fully aligned with the health of the corporation. They want the same things that the executives want. They want the company to create high quality goods and services and be a place that they're proud to work at and they want it to create, a, you know, be very, very successful financially over the long haul because that gives them security and, and, you know, and confidence. So there's a lot that's changing in that domain. There are other things I could talk about as well. So and as a matter of fact, there's also a whole chapter in the book, of course, on that very thing, the voice of the employee. But, but let's again, let, let's talk about, about the, the new rules. What, what, which ones do you think are most urgent uh, given the kinds of problems that I've already alluded to and that we've talked about so much? Well, it gives me a chance to mention a couple more. One of them is about, you know, how do we really define success? And for, you know, part of our working lives, we really thought of, of kind of, of the value as being uh, something you could put on the balance sheet. You know, you could measure the value of firms almost the way you could you could measure the value of a, a building or, and today it's all about the intangible assets. And so that's something that's changed fundamentally. It's been changing for decades and companies have gradually tried to figure out how to move in that direction. Business classrooms still teach kind of a, a, a way of measuring value that's dependent on being able to forecast out, you know, cash flows years in advance, discount them back. You know, you can't, discount the things that are absolutely critical to the health of the corporation. You can't discount the value of the ecosystem. You can't discount the value of employee loyalty, um, customer loyalty, um, trust. You can't discount trust. That is, it is absolutely clear, clear and research is, is pivotal on this question that, that trust is, is a, you know, having trust in the corporation is a, is a, a source of real value and continuity. So though, that's, a, that's a fundamental change. Another one that um, is, is apparent is how much the mere definition of responsibility is way outside of the control of the corporation. You know, responsibility used to be, the rule was it's kind of like what you could measure inside the gate, and maybe what your fence line neighbors might care about. 
Today, of course, global operations, extended supply chains, NGOs that are capable and, and, and have tactical ways to harness your brand or your customer base in order to make a point of or, or create a um, awareness of an issue that you may not feel is even in your providence or may not be something you can fully control, but they're happy to harness your brand and tie it to something that needs to be accomplished in the in the broader sphere and the long-term health of, our, of society, whether it's human rights, whether it's climate change, whether it's, you know, the, the quality of our fisheries or our water, you know, business is an agent of change and they are they're compelled to continue to make that an object lesson. And so these things are really complicated. The last thing I'd mention is that, you know, we, we, we tend to think that innovation is a function of competition. And when, when the things that are most critical to our long-term health as a society, when, when we're facing exist, truly existential risks, whether it's climate or growing inequality, or the questions of kind of equity and access, these don't get addressed one firm at a time. It requires uh, co-creation and collaboration, not just competition to move forward. And we seeing, we're seeing more examples of that and there are many rich ones to build on. Talk more about trust and, and the perils of discounting it and the challenges of rebuilding it. I mean, you have so many, case studies, you'd reference so many things in the book, you know, just think now, just it's been in the news again this week about the yeah. challenge Boeing had. Um, you know, how, how, how does a, how should a CEO look at that fundamental value? Well, I do think it starts with purpose. You know, we talk about corporate purpose, but you can also talk about the kind of People's, you know, this kind of new, we talk a lot about it with millennials, you know, that people want to, they're connecting the inside and outside there. They don't have the same boundaries around, around work that maybe, um, you know, boomers did when they first showed up in, uh, you know, in the workplace. But this, so you, so they're, we're expecting, employees expect their executives to be able to speak powerfully to the purpose of their corporation and that it's one that connects deeply back to kind of the public interest. So people like Larry Fink and of course back to the BRT statement and increasing numbers of executives will speak to this. But so it's but it's also the the question of trust is not just about purpose. It has to be about assuring them that your operations are cleanly aligned to the purpose. And that's a much more complicated endeavor than just speaking to the purpose. And in the process of doing so, and in speaking to these questions today, we're also exposing some of the blind spots that business is not, you know, it comes at a bigger cost to be thinking about, do we need to think differently about how we pay executives? It comes, do we need to be thinking differently about kind of the social contract with employees, contract workers, some of these questions that are being exposed because of recent events again. I mean, you know, within the last 10 days, 220 employees at Google announced that they have been secretly over the last year plus building a, a, a union. That union is inviting in contract workers, people that work in the name of the corporation but are not on their payroll and don't have the same uh, opportunity to advance in a career, you know, with the security of increases, you know, regular increases in, in uh, you know, wages and full benefits, et cetera. So we're both exposing some of the fault lines and things that business needs to address to really make sure that trust is a robust and, um, you know, and, and has the promise of being able to continue to make progress on these things that people care deeply about. Judy, you, you've now twice mentioned the uh, business roundtable statement of, I guess now we'd say two years ago, 2019, renouncing shareholder value as the organizing principle of, of public companies. You know, now that some time has passed, how big a deal is that? I mean, has the needle in your mind really moved? 
uh, do we see really systemic change is, or is there, you know, is this greenwashing? I mean, how should we look at that? Well, I think this is not a me surprise to you. Uh, I thought it was, it was a remarkably important moment when the, when the BRT um, came out with this restatement of corporate purpose and and, uh, and you know, and some of the audience knows that we were instrument. Uh, I, I fear using that word, but yeah, I think we played an important role in why in the business roundtable making this statement and uh, helped guide them to a lot of people that they, you know, worked with in their very serious process of stepping back and thinking this through. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a critically important moment. Now what? Right. So is this now when we get to talk about CEO pay? No, I, I'm going to save that for later. But, you know, now what? Let's just stay on the BRT for a minute. Uh, you also referenced climate change as one of the existential yep. issues of time. I, I, I think we expected by now the BRT to issue a statement about climate change. They have. Not they did it. They did it in September. So in September, this was the second thing. I mean, this is like nine months after they released, or almost a year after, a little more than a year after they released the statement on the corporate purpose. The business roundtable started at that time. In fact, when I was found out that the BRT statement was about to land the following Monday, I remember exactly where I was. It was Friday afternoon. I was on my way on vacation and I was about to get onto an island. And, you know, there we were, you know, taking in lots of email out in the middle of the North Atlantic. Uh, about the purpose statement, but they said at that time, and you'll be pleased to know, they said that we're also starting to do a real discernment process about uh, doing a policy on on carbon. And uh, they did, and they took the better part of a year to do it. And when it finally landed, which was on a, in a delay, um, you know, it's supposed to come out in the spring, it finally landed in September, it didn't get a lot of noise. But let's remember, this is September. We don't yet know the outcome of the election, and it would make a big difference. It's made a bigger difference that there is now not only a Democratic administration, but of course there's a Democratic, you know, at least almost majority in uh, in both houses, and so it is a different moment. But the fact that the business roundtable did that at all, I think, says volumes about a new business roundtable. The business roundtable had not even touched climate in 15 years. It's because that trade association, during the period of time that I've been observing them, was really about um, finding those few things that are either of no cost to corporations or that are you know, resoundly shared you know, as a goal, you know, reduce taxes, reduce regulation. So that was the kind of mainstay of when there was a collaborative effort when the BR in the business roundtable, that was the kind of thing they focused on. We're in a different era now. For the business roundtable to be taking, there's winners and losers in climate, as we know, although we knew that the vast majority of members of the business roundtable would want to get a price on carbon. You know, let's let's try to be able to, you know, predict a future that's going to be a healthy one for business. And so that is, it's it's a signaling device that the business roundtable is again trying to ascertain what's in the longer term health of business overall, as opposed to the the individual kind of needs or desires of individual corporations. And so that's a really important shift. And we're seeing it not just the BRT, we've seen it in the last week by the kinds of statements that are being made by other trade associations in this moment. You, you say uh, in, in your book that financial capital is no longer a scarce resource. What, what do you mean by that? And why is it so important? You know, I we used to think that the financial capital was kind of like the, the piece that we needed to pay the most attention to, if you will. There's a wonderful economist from the UK, um, John Kay, who writes about corporations as being, he talks about the hollow corporation. Corporations, the, some of the ones that are at the, you know, are the largest, you know, holdings in the stock market, you know, the most valuable corporations are not big employers. I mean, Amazon hires a lot of people, so does Walmart. There are companies where people need to show up in place and that hire a lot of people in the United States of America. But you take Apple, which is one of the ones that he uses as an example. Apple has outsourced 
all of its real, you know, intense, you know, labor intensive functions. I mean, the manufacturing is all done outside of the United States for the most part. You know, the IP then is housed, you know, in some other corporation. It's, it is, it's not a big employer in the same sense. I don't mean that they don't probably, I'm sure they have over 100,000 employees in the US, but this is, you know, some of the largest corporations don't really hire anybody because technology companies tend to be, you know, labor light. And so why are we focused so intently on financial capital? We've had two companies that went public last year, Spotify and Snap that I write about in the book. Neither one of them went public in order to raise money. They actually went public just to give an exit to their early round investors. And so that's a fundamental shift in our relationship with the stock market. So back to the question. So why do we build so many signals about the health of the stock market or the kind of the individual price of stock of an individual company? Why do we use that as a signaling device about the health of the enterprise? So disconnect. I, we have a wonderful audience and I'm starting to get questions uh, from the audience as well. And I'm going to intersperse some of them. And, and, and one is, you know, what is the role of boards in ensuring that companies play by these new rules? And, you know, what, what should we expect from CEOs? What should we expect from boards? Which should boards be, a, a, you know, a visible active force? Should they be quiet reformers? What are your views? Well, I think for both executives and boards, one of the things we need is, is some deeper listening from within. Um, I think it's an interesting moment where in there, there's, uh, there's good models of companies that have done this well, including Walmart in some incredibly important moments. Um, but yeah, I think we're going to see a huge amount of change in boards. We did a, a seminar last fall um, you know, after kind of COVID and we all went offline and started doing more of these kinds of things. We did a kind of a consultation around what's changing about the role of boards. And in preparing for that, we spoke to a Henry Crown fellow who sits on a number of boards. And she, she predicted that when we finally get out of Zoom land and go back to work, um, that there will be a real turnover in boards. You know, there's a lot of directors that may be hanging on right now and saying, okay, I'm not gonna abandon the ship while you know, we're still in crisis but that may be tired of the number of hours that are required now of a board member and are ready to move on. And I think we'll see a real change in boards. I think we're gonna see a generational change in boards. I think we'll start to see the same thing at executives and new people will start to move into these positions who have almost a different sensibility, have, have almost come to the table in a different era where the, where the where the job of the CEO is different than it was 20 years ago. The CEO, as our friends at Corn Ferry keep reminding me, is more like a, a leader of a community now. You know, they, they have a complex jobs. They need complex ways of understanding the impact of their decisions kind of through the food chain internally and externally. So, um, you know, uh, You've been talking, you've talked in here, it's a big theme of the book about the voice of employees, and now you're talking about boards. What about employee voices on boards? You know, we sometimes lose sight of the fact that the United States is an outlier with respect to many other very successful capitalist-based economies, Germany, Scandinavia, uh, in terms of employee direct participation in boards. We're also an outlier in the way unions have, have grown radically down in, in, in significance. To talk a little bit about those, the, the, the structural uh, uh, limitations, if you will, about employee engagement. I think the most important governance question today is, is, is that at some level it's about turning back inward. You know, the real value creation needs to be about the health of the enterprise. Is it being equipped to make, to live as long as it can, as useful life? Is it, and is it being, is it designed to make high quality decisions that stand the test of time? So the idea that you can do this kind of with a single objective function, whether it be profit maximization 
or share price of course is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's simply not how, how a good executive operates. These are complex jobs. I don't know a manager who is not able to, you know, doesn't have to think about multiple objectives simultaneously or, or you know, both long and short term benefit. So when we get back to boards, you know, their job has changed fundamentally as well. And this, this moment of discernment around employees is maybe the piece of governance that's most critical. So, you know, friends of the Aspen Institute, like Leo Strine, the former chancellor of the Delaware court, has, has positioned, is there a redefinition of the comp committee itself? Does that committee need to embrace kind of the health of the enterprise in terms of all of its employees? Should it be thinking about not just this, the executive, you know, and the management team, but thinking about how everybody's paid? For example, but our colleagues, my, my colleagues at the Business Society program, um, Miguel Padro and Felicia Davis, are working on a what we call a, a, a lab. It's essentially a fast-paced design exercise over the last six months to identify new forms of governance that actually speak exactly to the question you've asked. And we are seeing some interesting examples. There are companies that are adopting something called a mirror board which is essentially a board of employees. It's almost like an advisory board that they can design to make sure that they're hearing from different age cohorts, from people in different kinds of jobs and roles and with different kinds of life experiences to bring to bear. So there's a lot of, we're trying to kind of essentially think fresh. What does governance look like in this era? So you referred just now to comp committees. I, I said we'd turn to executive Finally. at some point. Um, so, you know, the shift toward equity-based pay, and you and I have talked about this since we first met in the, in the 80s, um, you know, has produced, you know, runaway CEO pay, uh, absolutely and relatively uh, just incredible uh, um, multiples compared to non-CEO executives, compared to median employees, and certainly compared to the lowest paid people. Uh, yet we're still seeing, you know, share buybacks and and all kinds of of, of mechanisms, as as the as the pay continues to skyrocket. What, you know, it, it, I, I think many people are saying this is not, this is this is not just, you know, mass jealousy, uh, uh, but it really represents something that has to change. I mean, right. will it change? How can it change? Well, that's, that is the question. I think it will change. I think it has to change. Um, how that change takes place is, is, a, is a complicated question. It's, uh, CEO pay is kind of what we call in New York a third rail problem. You know, nobody really wants to touch it. And frankly, neither employees, not labor unions, um, not investors, they don't care if the CEO is making what seems like, you know, just a impossibly large amount of money they welcome they 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 wish they could do that too they they're thinking about their own place in the enterprise and what what's possible and if the company is hugely successful and the corp and the ceo makes a lot of money that's not a that's not a concern investor be. sorry should be though shouldn't it it should be it it we need you need to be creating kind of a system of fairness and integrity that works and supports and recognizes the contribution of everybody, everybody who's a contributor. So we do see companies that do that. I mean, I, I write about Delta and their profit sharing plan that they created when they were coming out of bankruptcy. They needed to do it to keep the pilots and everybody else showing up for work. And it was a remarkably successful until the airline industry crashed last year. It was remarkably a remarkable way for to take the real upside of the corporation and share it deeply. Everybody participates in that profit sharing plan. And we have lots of examples to draw from through employee ownership and that sort of thing. But the, the design of pay, the design of the CEO's pay in and of itself is a problem. You can't fix this by just starting bottom up. You have to look at what you're paying the executive to do. It's not just about that they're making more money than most people can imagine. That is not 
for me is not the most, the biggest issue. It's the actual design. What are we paying them to do? And you mentioned share buybacks. We're paying them to do share buybacks. If you, if you make what's called TSR, total shareholder return, as long as that's the biggest signaling device in pay, if that's the measure that is most important in determining whether or not the CEO is being successful, it's the antithesis of what the business roundtable said in their statement about the purpose of the corporation. These things are, they're in conflict with one another. So what the change that has to happen, and then maybe we can still come back to this question of how it will happen, but the change that has to happen is to move away from this system that everybody you talk to complains about. It's called, you know, it's a peer benchmarking system where, you know, executive comp consultants use a peer group of CEOs chosen essentially to continue to keep pay high and really ratchet up. And so as a result of that peer group comparison, the design of pay, what we have seen, according to Corn Ferry's research in the last decade, is that the senior executives, their pay has, can, has grown at 7% compounded rate over the last 10 years, while everybody else, middle managers and on down, are getting about 3%. Well, that's designed for increasing inequality. So we have to think about the whole structure of how this happens, and we need to deeply simplify pay, which has gotten so complex that nobody really understands what's happening and the behavioral kind of effects of, the, of, what, of what the CEO is being paid to do. So Judy, another, another element, which I didn't mention in my introduction, that's been a very important part of the work of the Business and Society Program has been your work with business schools and also with education at the undergraduate level in business, which I think most people, at least on this call, will, will know, but I think it's a surprise to many people, is by far the largest undergraduate concentration in the United States. You, you talk in, in, in the book in many contexts about systemic change. What, what can what is the role of business education and has is business education is it ahead of this curve is it behind the curve is it being the leader uh that that you'd like it to be in in affecting these changes i don't think it's a leader um i think business education naturally follows business and for important reasons it follows it follows in some respects, because it takes signals from recruiters and um, and from alumni, and what students are speaking about now is not the only signal of what's important. And of course, academia, you know, almost by definition, the tenure system is something that tends to hold all old ideas in place rather than uh, create. Um, you know, a flourishing of new ideas. But, you know, I'm, 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 I'm we're playing the long game here. We've been at this question of business education. It's a, it's a powerful, powerful lever. If you, if you want, you have to start with what people are taught. Um, you know, uh, Danella Meadows and, you know, people who, you know, created the kind of our focus on systemic change and how change takes place, they all start with mindset. You, know, you have to start with what does somebody actually believe to be true? Where do they live? You know, what's the experiences that have forged their thinking? And business education is kind of a leveling place. It is still the most popular degree for people who end up in, in boardrooms and in the executive suite, more so than law and engineering, which in its day was kind of the path to being the CEO. And even though the MBA has kind of maybe fallen off um, a bit in the last years, it's the it's an important place for students to go who want to understand. This is why I went to business school. They want to understand why how things work. How does change take place? How do you lead? How do you construct teams that work well? So if people, anybody who's interested in tackling complex problems wants to understand how the private sector works and how it works in partnership with others and kind of what the, you know, how to work, how to manage. And so that will continue to be the case for people, whether they want to work on climate change or they want to work on, on something that is more pedestrian than that. So there's a lot of work to do. I will only call out that I think the place in business schools that we're most stuck is in finance classrooms that are still by and large 
teaching to shareholder primacy almost out of its simplicity more than I think anything about their beliefs. Uh, and, and again, we have a wonderful audience. Please continue to have your questions come in because I, I can keep asking my own questions all, all afternoon. Um, you know, one of the things that makes this book so, you know, frankly, entertaining, um, uh, Judy, are all the, the you know, the, the case studies you use, not, maybe not surprisingly, uh, being a book about business and given the role of uh, sort of the case method in, in business schools. And I, I wonder if you could just pick, I mean, there's so many in here, I don't know which one I'd pick that you could just describe to people in the webinar as illustrative of some of the points you make. I mean, for example, the you know, Merck Mechdesign uh, versus Valiant uh, example, or the, uh, you know, codfish. I mean, there's so many. I mean, just just one that you think sets up the, the you know, your, your issues so well that you wanted to feature it in your book. Well, I'll mention one very briefly, and then maybe another one. Um, Herb Keller, who built uh, Southwest Airlines, is one of the case examples I talk about. And I, it's powerful today because of he, he believes so deeply in employees as being not only the front line, but kind of the heart and soul of the enterprise. And so he built a company that was remarkably successful, not just for everybody who worked there, but of course for shareholders, by putting, um, ex putting employees at the heart of the purpose of the corporation. But the one that comes to mind, because we were just talking about mindset for me, is Lee Scott of Walmart and then Doug McMillan, who's the CEO of Walmart now. I mean, Lee Scott, you know, he had his reckoning in Katrina, where that moment where there was on the front page of every newspaper in the country after the, the day after the storm um, blew through, that all of these Walmart trucks that were prepared, loaded up with diapers and water and blankets, you know, to try to make it into the stadium and to the, you know, the heart of the city where people were stranded. And, um, you know, Lee, Lee Scott at the time said, wait a minute, how do I get more press like this? You know, the, he had been battling for 10 years, the environmentalists and the labor unions that were still calling out the myriad ways in which Walmart was not thinking long-term and he really pivoted and it was that experience it was the experience it was like wait a minute and he stopped and he listened to his employees and the company literally changed the way they think about kind of their role their supply chain and being a real change agent in in new ways of thinking about environmental sustainability from packaging to fisheries to you know, energy conservation. You know, you roll forward, Doug McMillan had that same moment when there was the horrific shooting in South Haven, Mississippi and, um, and outside El Paso. And um, you know, he listened as well. And in a very short period of time, he made, uh, you know, made the decision to take every part of the kind of guns and ammo off of the shelves of Walmart. Um, difficult decision to do for a company that, of course, draws people from all kinds of different walks of life and, and exists virtually everywhere. So I think it's those experiences, whether it's you know a confrontation with an employee in the parking lot or somebody in the employee cafeteria, that are often more important than all of the data and the metrics and all of this ways in which we somehow think we can solve this problem. One of, one of the audience, just on this point we've made a few times about employees and employee voice has asked, you know, what will have to change for more companies to recognize the significance of employees and make different decisions that demonstrate that they really care about them and recognize their value? Well, I think I almost think that what's necessary today, we talk in the Business Society program, we talk about choice points. Where does business have real agency? And it's almost as if the board and the executive just step back and do an audit and say, what are the levers we actually have? Obviously, wages and benefits is one. But the other one that I think we could talk about it, you know, and we'll see more about because of, of what we saw happening last week at Google um, with creating a new union, is that contract workers, the 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 many decisions that have been made, not just by corporations, but of course also by nonprofits and hospitals and everybody else, to take certain job functions and put them into, you know, create contract relationships. This is a um, this is a a time where we have an opportunity 
to really think about the role of contract workers and 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 think about whether or not there's a different way to proceed forward. There's clearly a moment here where we need real agency by business to be thoughtful about the social contract. And, you know, that's part of the puzzle here too. You know, you, you've also talked about sort of leverage points and, and way to leverage change, champion change. And you reference a number of times in the book, again, not everyone on this call will be familiar with it, but your, your own first movers program. And you tell us a little bit about that and, and why those people, those functions are so important. Well, it's a fabulous program. And you know, a shout out to Nancy McGaw, who first founded the program and Eli Minilinsky and Rachel Botus and the rest of the team that manage it today. It's a it's a one of many fellowship programs at the Aspen Institute. This one is focused on people exclusively on people who work in business. They're mostly large corporations. They're not, you know, the smaller, um, you know, startups or mission driven corporations, although some of them are. Um, and what we focus on is the opportunity to build the skills of people who are embedded inside, regardless what function you know, they're in. You know, this isn't just people in the CSR business or who are managing the ESG portfolio. These are people who keep they can be working in supply chain, they can be working in human resources, they can be working virtually in a staff function, virtually anywhere in the company. And what we do is we build things like their storytelling and listening skills and problem framing and reframing the ability to attract and, and work well with mentors um, and communicate. We, we, we create a community of fellow travelers, but also teach habits of reflection and pulling back to take the time and, and to be think sensibly and thoughtfully about the consequences of business decisions. And um, shout out to any first movers who are on the on the uh, call with us today. We we work we we continue to work alongside these change agents and to um, honestly are, are are so inspired by the work that they take on the changes that they that they that they work on. I mean, things like Neil Jacoby at AT and T who worked on a you know, literally worked on the point of purchase for phones and said, wait a minute, when you're buying your child their first phone, have we taken advantage of that moment to fully instruct parents about the, you know, the ways in which they can set up the phone to protect that child from inappropriate use of the phone? You know, that is not what we've been talking about during our course of our conversation today. It's one of a myriad of examples of specific things that somebody's taken on. You would think that would be easy to move through and accomplish, but of course, AT&T initially may not have been excited about the idea of signaling to somebody that they're about to sell them something that actually has some problems embedded in it. So being able to step back and, re and reflect on that problem and to then think about, for Neil, to be able to think about how do I go about designing the conversation internally to make people, um, to frame it differently so that we can actually elevate this idea and have it in, uh, in, in endorsed and embraced. And of course it ended up getting great publish uh, cover, coverage in the Wall Street Journal when they finally did it. So um, that's a one tiny, one tiny, but really critically important example of the kind of change that our first movers bring about. A number of the questions uh, from, from your audience uh, are addressed to uh, the role of government. Uh, and, you know, we, we live in a time you mentioned earlier, you know, businesses, many of them uh, are focused on government primarily. They'll lower their taxes or reduce their regulations. And we all acknowledge how influential business institutions are, but can, and we also are aware that, you know, many people think capitalism is sort of in crisis, that in, unless things change and perceptions change, um, you know, that, that you know, the, the, the goose that laid the golden egg may, you know, may not even survive. So where, 
how important is government in this? Can business do this alone? Is business able to? And I mean, can one have sort of a libertarian act? Think that virtuous boards and virtuous CEOs can solve all these problems? Or does the government have to have, in fact, a bigger role? You know, both, both institutions are obviously important. Um, you know, right now, elements, right now, neither is trusted, which is another problem. <laughs> and have not been. Um, you know, government kind of swung back when Richard, when Edelman um, trust barometer, Richard Edelman uh, ran another version of the trust barometer when we were deep in COVID, although we're deep in it now too as well. But this was, I think it came out in April or May of this year. And one of the things it found is that kind of government had, you know, had shot up in that period of time because people were reminded about how critical it was. You know, we've just come through an extraordinary moment or I can't say we've come through it yet. We are poised to come through an extraordinary moment of something that is absolutely at the heart of, of what you talked about. This, the fast pace with which the um, vaccines have been you know, designed, tested, and proven, and are now being made available to the population, no one expected that it could happen this quickly. It is something that happened under the Trump administration. Let's give them some credit for for, for that design, if, if, um, if that's fair to say, other people would be closer to it than I do, I am. But it's also an interesting moment where you saw the power of not only good collaboration between government enabling the private sector to move forward, but a consciousness that the solutions would come from the private sector, but also another layer of this that was where corporations were helping one another that they, you know, you read about the fact that there was better and more open communication between and, and among competitors who were all in pursuit of the same ends. There will be a big enough pie. There will be lots of people who benefit. There are lots of corporations that'll, or drug manufacturers that will, you know, get a piece of their, you know, the return on their investment. Um, but that's a really interesting kind of example of something right now. Can we set up the rules of government to enable a playing field, a level playing field to help innovation kind of move forward in, in, um, in a productive way, um, but get the best out of the private sector and get the best out of the public sector, which takes us back to money and politics and this moment, because we've seen an interesting conversation develop in this last few days here about money and politics and corporations stopping and saying, wait a minute, maybe we don't want to be financially supporting, maybe we should not be supporting um, members of Congress who have been, you know, resisting kind of the rule of law here. Well, that's an interesting moment for a business reflection to step back and say, wait a minute, if we want, if we want rule of law, we not only need to be thoughtful in this moment about how we have used our money, we may need to really rethink what has been the purpose of political contributions to begin with? Are those really designed for the health of society or are they about unequal advantage? And for the system to work well, for trust to be you know, a critical element of, of kind of the public's belief in business for us to continue to assume that companies, um, you know, uh, you know to, to, to have our belief in industry and, and private sector initiative, I think we need to step back and kind of rebalance this as well. And it'll be incumbent on corporations to think about that and to see if they can redesign the protocols under which they, if they make public contributions, what they're for and what that's all about. Yeah, as you say, we may be at multiple inflection points now with what's going on in the world uh, uh, with respect to, for example, uh, money and money. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just, it's making me think of one other piece of this puzzle, which is it's back to the business roundtable and the role of corporations and why they put money into politics. I mean, it has a lot of it has been about, you know, tax and, and cost of operation. And we're going to see in real time with a Biden administration and with, um, you know, majority in both houses, um, what happens now? 
are we going to go back to the old conversation where you know business will do whatever they can to thwart increases in taxes? Do we actually have to increase the tax rate or can we actually do the second part that we were supposed to do last year when the tax rate came down for the outrageously high 36% while the effective rate was something only like seven or 9% and brought it back down to 24%, I think it is. The idea was let's have a level playing field and everybody pays that 24%. 36% is too high, but let's make sure that everybody is participating in this. Will we, is that how we're going to approach this question or will it be back about the raid and, you know, what it was in this administration versus SAS administration? There's a lot of work to do there. And some of that requires corporations again to say, what part of this puzzle do I want to be a part of here? Like, what is our contribution? Where does our agency matter? And, um, you know, are we paying fairly for the privilege of being a U.S. corporation and the goods and services that are delivered from education of our citizens to, you know, roads and airports? Well, that actually may be a, a, a good theme to, to end on. We only have another minute or two. But I, I wonder, Judy, if there is something that we haven't discussed or an overarching thought that you'd like to, to, to leave us with or a key a key message or hope about, you know, the impact that this book may have? Well, I think I just go back to what you started us right out at the very beginning, Elliot, which is, I, you know, I love working with business. Um, business people get out of bed in the morning and, you know, the glass is half full, you know. Um, those of us in nonprofits tend to think in um, the glass is half empty terms. You know, we, we you know, have a lot of angst about the problems and great intentions and, and worry a lot. And, but we don't talk the way a business person does when they, they think in terms of opportunity. And risk and opportunity are obviously closely intertwined. And business is seeing risks on the horizon that are forcing them to step back and and calibrate differently. But the reason that I wrote the book is because I believe so deeply that we have to have business at the table to solve our most complex problems. And that takes me back to climate change. Climate change is an existential threat. We haven't talked about it much today. We have wonderful programs at the Aspen Institute that work deeply across these questions, the Energy and Environment Program, of course, but other, other, other contributors as well. And we do not solve climate one company is at a time. We have to get a price on carbon. And that is something that happens, it's going to happen in coalition. It requires business to be speaking with a, it's a, a voice that is different than it's been used uh, before. And so you know, I'm hopeful and believe, sorry. Mm -hmm. I didn't so, hear what you said. I just said, as I was saying, and it also requires Nonprofits and organizations like the Business Society program, and it requires absolutely. government. Absolutely, it's a it's a full court press, and it requires everybody at the table, and it also requires as citizens for us to not continue to think that we can have it both ways. You know, there's con there's going to be sacrifices for everybody along the road here, and we have to be able to sacrifice as consumers, and um, you know as well. So as consumers, as investors, I mean, there's a, th this is a, this is a big lift and um, business is a signaling device here, but we're all part of this question. Well, Judy, I tell you, it's real been a privilege to work with you closely over the last decade plus. Uh, I, this is really a wonderful book. Uh, I wish I could imagine you traveling all over the country in your book tour, as opposed to zooming from your living room. Uh, but this book it deserves and will get a great deal of attention. And uh, as you and your team continue to work on these uh, urgent issues, never more urgent than today. So I thank you. Uh, I thank all of our guests. And uh, tell all of your friends, if you're interested in hearing more from Judy on these themes, that we'll probably have this up on the Aspen website within a day or two. Thank you all very much. Thank you.